Okay, so we got an interesting year today. <laughs> um, what did I call this year? I'm going to call it cutting your fingernails in the right order. Okay, the meta halakhic implications of cutting your fingernails in the right order. So two little prefaces. Okay, uh, one preface is I've told this story before. Um, I think that when I was converting to Judaism, then the based in uh, one of the things the based in did to prepare me was they, they gave me a English translation of the Kitzer Shulchan Aruch, which is the abridged Shulchan Aruch. And they basically said, learn this, you know, and I didn't know any better. Uh, and I was a very devoted student and I had like a, you know, I don't know, I don't know what exactly what photographic or eidetic memory is, but like I had a very, very good memory. And so I just sat down and I learned it. Uh, and that's what, that was my first exposure to like learning halacha. Okay. Which is, I don't know if that's the best first exposure, but I remember when we went to the house of one of the rabbis who was instrumental in bringing us to Judaism, um, Rabbi Lappin. Uh, then, you know, I guess he was asking about like what I was doing in my conversion. And I mentioned that I was learning the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch and Rabbi Lappin is kind of a, uh, you know, he enjoys being provocative a little bit. Uh, so he said this, I think intentionally provocatively, and I can't do a South African accent, but you can, you have to imagine that he said, in my opinion, the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch should be used as a doorstop, you know? And I said, what, you know, cause this is like a halakha book that the Basin gave me. So he, he gave an analogy and he said, if you take, uh, I don't know how many people know what a phone book is these days, but phone book, you take a phone book, he says, and it just lists all of the, um, all of the names of all the people who live in the city. And you can't tell from looking at the names, whether this person is rich or poor or prominent or like a, a, a low life or like a doctor or a, a, an author, you know, it, they're just all presented equally. And he said, the kids of Shulchan Aruch basically just takes, you know, all of these things, which, you know, de oraisa, derbanan, minhag, superstition, Kabbalah, you know, practice, and just puts them all into one thing. And you can't really like tell what is, uh, you know, what place everything has in the system. And that made a huge impact on me. And, and not that I uh, was influenced uh, by that thing, but I, if, I think in the way that, I think the same part of me that loves the Ramam's Mishnah Torah and that loves the Aruch HaShulchan because they actually present halacha in a systematic way where you can tell where everything is in the system. Um, then when I teach halacha, I try to like convey to my students, you know, what the categories are. Like at the very least, is this Del Raisa, Der Banan, or Minhag? And then uh, there are a lot of subcategories within those, you know? So, so that's preface number one, and, and that's relevant uh, uh, to this year. Okay, preface number two, and then I'll, I'll connect them, is this year was really, uh, uh, we, we, we can thank Sarah Spielman and Rifki Elman, okay, uh, that um, they, I guess, have a halacha chavrusa. These are, uh, you know, my, my, two of my students. So they, um, uh, Sarah texted me or uh, sent me a voice note, and she said, Rifki and I have a halacha chavrusa, and we were learning through the halachas and we got to these halachos about cutting your fingernails in a certain order. And we weren't sure because it's the thing we were learning said that it's Kabbalistic, but it also says that it's brought down in the Shulchan Arach. And we were wondering like, what's the deal with these halachos? Okay. So I remember this from the Kitzur Shulchan Arach experience. And I was under the impression that this was just a superstitious or Kabbalistic thing. Okay. Um, and uh, but I, I, I didn't realize it was in the, the actual Shulchan Aruch, so I decided to like look into it, and then that gave rise to this year, and gave rise to this question of how do you know, you know, which things that look weird or crazy are actual halacha, and which ones are not, and I'm gonna give you two examples which should be their own shirim, but this past Sukkot, uh, one of my students like was asking about the on a uh, Hoshana Rava when we take the Aravos and we hit them on the ground. And one of my students said something like, Oh, like, is there any basis to that? And I said, Not only is there a basis to that, that is a Minhag Nevi'im. You know, the Ram identifies that as one of the Minhag Nevi'im. And like, there are Gemaras about it. And, you know, it, it's, you know, so yeah, it looks crazy, but it's a real thing. Second, secondly, uh, I think people are vaguely aware of that there's halachos about what order you put on and tie your shoes. And I also used to think that that is like a totally, uh, you know, like made up thing, but it's, that's actually in the Gemara. Now it's not whether or not you have to do it or, or what the, that should be its own shear. But the, the, uh, the takeaway from this should, one of the takeaways should be that just because something looks crazy, doesn't mean it is crazy and you have to look into it. And when I looked into this, it, it, it was not as crazy as I thought, but we're going to have to like, see what, what we find. Okay. So let's start with what, uh, what the, uh, Shulchan Aruch says. Okay. And obviously, you know, this is a wide ranging topic that has uh, a lot of like, you know, lenses up to a lot of side questions. So feel free to ask the questions. Uh, I might not be able to take up all of them, but uh, 
Uh, yeah, it's a big topic. Okay, so Shulchan Arach says in Simen, uh, Orachim Simen Reish Samach, which is about um, Shabbos preparations. Okay, uh, so we're talking on Erev Shabbos. Uh, uh, oh, and by the way, what I did here is I also put the the approximate um, time period that the halachic sources were uh, that we're dealing with are in because I think that's relevant here. Okay, um, mitzvah lirchotz kol uh, It is a mitzvah to wash your entire body. Okay, background here. Sorry, pause for one second. Make sure we're all on the same page. So the Shulchan Aruch um, wrote a his main work. So it's written by Rav Yosef Karo. Um, he, uh, he wrote a work called the Beis Yosef on the tour, which was where he got the structure for the Shulchan Aruch from, which is a halakhic code written by Rabbi Yaakov ben Asher. And the Beis Yosef is his primary work. And then he kind of summarized all the findings in the Shulchan Aruch, which basically against his wishes became like the halakha sefer for, for all of Klai Israel. And Rav Moshe Israelis, the Ramah, was going to write his own halacha sefer, but once he saw how widely spread the Shulchan Aruch was, he wrote the Haggah, or the Sefer Hamapa, which is the, the uh, a, a gloss or like a, a commentary on top of the Shulchan Aruch, and that's uh, signified by this word uh, Haggah, which means the gloss. So there are two styles of gloss. Sometimes he just adds explanation, and he's not disagreeing with the, the, the Shulchan Aruch, and then sometimes he'll bring down the Psaq for the Ashkenazim, because the Shulchan Aruch's Psaq is mostly based on Sephardic authorities. So in this case, the Shulchan Aruch says, mitzvah lirchot, and then the, the Ramah adds kol gufo, and he's not saying by way of machlo, because he, this is just an explanation. So it's mitzvah to wash your entire body on Erev Shabbos. V'im ef sharlo, yirchot panav yadav raglav v'chamin be'erev Shabbos. And if it's impossible to take a full shower or bath, you should at least wash your hands, feet, and face or face, hands, and feet in hot water on Erev Shabbos. Okay, so that's uh, that's for Kabbalah Shabbos. Umitzvah lachuf harosh. It is a mitzvah to um, to wash your hair. Ulegaleach atzipornaim be'erev Shabbos. Now, legaleach usually is translated as to shave, and tzipornaim are fingernails. Uh, I don't think it means to shave your fingernails because that'd be weird, but it might mean to like file your nails. Uh, um, I don't know. I don't think they had nail clippers back then. Um, so mitzvah to like cut your nails on, on Erev Shabbos. Okay. And that's what brings us into the realm of nail cutting. Now we get to the Ramah himself. And he says, Vim hayu sa'aros rosho gedolos, if the hairs on your head were big, which I don't think means that the hairs are thick. And I also don't think it means the hairs are long. I think it means like the phenomenon of like what people call like a Jufro. Like if your hair is like all poofy, you know, um, mitzvah legalcha. And then it's mitzvah cut, to cut your hair on Erev Shabbos. Okay. Then he says, ar halacha. Which is, ukishinoto tzipornav, when you cut your fingernails, lo yitel osam kisidran, you should not cut them in order. Okay. Instead, he says, yaschil bismol, start on your left hand, bikamitza, on your ring finger, uviamin baetzba, and on your right hand with your index finger. The simin laze and the, uh, the, uh, the, Reminder, the mnemonic device, it's not a really good one that he brings down because it's not a real word. Dalad bet he gimel aleph bismol u bet dalad aleph gimel he biamin. Okay, so what that is, is it looks like this. You go ring finger, index finger, um, uh, pinky, middle finger, thumb. Then you go on, on your left hand. Then you go on your right hand, um, uh, index finger, um, ring finger, thumb, um, middle finger, pinky. Okay, now that's gonna sound like, uh, how can I remember that? I guarantee you, I think, by the end of this, you'll remember the order, okay? Uh, but that's what it is. Or if you wanna put it in, um, I don't know, maybe because I play piano with sheet music, then I think of it in terms of uh, numbers. So it's four, two, five, three, one, and then uh, two, four, one, three, five. Okay, now before we go on, I'm just curious, um, uh, I don't know, I guess, oh, can I do a poll? I could do a poll. I've never done that before. Create, hold on just a second here. Oh, it's taking me to the whole thing. Maybe I can't do this. Oh, maybe, hold on a second. Ah, oh, this is gonna be too, too, too much stuff to do, Never mind. I, I'm, I am curious, by show of hands, how many of you uh, do this when you cut your fingernails? Like, I have no idea how widespread this is. Um, okay, so I'm seeing no, I'm seeing no hands raised, okay? Um, oh, we got a no. Okay, good, good. No's, a lot of no's here. Yeah, all right. Um, and how many of you have heard of this? I guess a uh, thumbs up if you've heard of it. Okay, we got one, uh, two, three. Okay, yeah, right. Okay, fine. Okay, so 
again, I thought that this was a superstitious thing or just a Kabbalistic thing. Okay. And I'll explain what I mean by just a Kabbalistic thing later on. Okay. But if you see here, the source that the Ramah quotes, first of all, again, this is the Ramah, right? And by default, the assumption is that if you are Ashkenazic, the default assumption is you follow the Ramah. I'm not saying you always do, but that is the default assumption because that's why he wrote it. And that's what most of Ashkenazic halakha is based on. But the quote, the, the source of the Ramah is the Abu Diram or Abu Draham, as they, Abu Darham, as they say here. Okay. And Abu Darham is my go to source for, for tefillah stuff. Okay. And that's a reshown. So I, so, so, you know, it is, uh, so that kind of shocked me here. Okay. Now you'll notice who does not bring this down the Shulchan Arach. Okay. The Shulchan Arach himself does not bring this down and quiz here, basic Jewish facts here. What are the three halakhic works that the Shulchan Arach based his sock on? You don't have to name all of them. You can name one. If you just think of it, just shout out. The Rambam. The Rambam. Right. The Torah. Okay. Riff. The, the riff. Or no. Is that what you said? The riff? Yeah, the riff. Yeah, okay, the riff. Okay, good. And then the third one was? The tour, did I say? Yeah, so the tour slash the rush. Okay, the tour is really the rush's son, but a lot of the rush's psaac we get from the tour. Okay, so the reason why the Shulchan Arach doesn't, and, and again, in general, the Shulchan Arach goes two out of, or goes with the majority of those three authorities. And in rare cases, he goes with a minority. So if you look at the those three sources, okay, the riff does not bring this down the halacha. The Rambam does not bring this down the halacha and the Rush does not bring down the halacha. Okay, so that's why the Shulchan Aruch doesn't bring it down, all right? But my first clue was to look at the Abu Durham. And so actually the first clue was I looked at the Ramaz commentary on the tour, which is called the Darche Moshe. And he just quotes the Abu Durham. So I went right to the Abu Durham. And uh, here's what he says, okay? And this is going to be uh, uh, interesting and I think funny, okay? And I don't mean that in an insulting way. Okay, so he says like this. So this is in the Abu Durham in the, he has a whole parak called Seder and Tilas uh, uh the order of cutting your fingernails, okay? So he says, Hanoto Tzipornav, someone who cuts his fingernails, Tzarek Lito Osam al Zeh Seder. So he says Yad Yamin, um, 13524. So it's different than the Ramah. Okay, first he starts on his right and he starts with the thumb. And then he says Yad Smol, um, uh, 42135, uh, okay. So he says, I found a, uh, another mnemonic device. Now, typically when Chazal have a mnemonic device, they will use a, they'll use a phrases with mnemonic. So for example, um, there's a halacha that you need to wash your hands before eating food that's dipped in one of seven liquids. And the mnemonic is Yad Shachat Dam, which stands for Yayin, Devash, Shemin, Chalav, Tal, um, Dom and Mayan, uh, and Mayan. Okay. So the, so it's Yad Shachat Dam, which are words, hand Shach's blood. Okay. So that's just the style of Chazal. Um, some want to say that they're like philosophical ideas. So his mnemonic is Kashia Bloterus. Okay. Uh, which is a cute, cute little thing, which means like a, a difficulty without a resolution. So what is the mnemonic? So Pirush. So, um, the Kuf stands for Kmitza, which means ring finger. Okay, the shin stands for um, small. So you start with your ring finger on the left. Okay, so now he's going with the Ramah's order. Okay, so ring finger left. Then you've got the yud stands for um, yamin. Then you go to your right. And then uh, the aleph stands for etzba, which means um, index finger. Okay, and what about the rest of it? So the phrase below tirutz means, hold on, means, <laughs> this is a funny one. Be'azhara lecha ata takutz yom revi'i vahala tipornacha. That you are warned or, or, or in, instructed to cut your fingernails from Wednesday and on. Okay. Now, um, Without reading ahead, anyone want to uh, take a guess as to why you should cut your fingernails on either Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday? Preparations for Shabbos. Preparations for Shabbos. Okay, right. Okay, so he says, Because um, 
Okay, so I think this is a fairly well known halacha that the latest you can make havdalah is uh, Tuesday. Okay, because Sunday, Monday, Tuesday are considered like of the previous week. Those are considered days after Shabbos. And then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday are days leading into Shabbos. So uh, he says, he's here. Um, uh, okay, so he says, therefore, you are warned that you should cut your fingernails on from Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday so that it's for Kabbalah Shabbos. And that's a general principle that anything you do in preparation for Shabbos is considered Kabbalah Shabbos. So when you go shopping for food, if you buy the food and say, this is for Shabbos, then, uh, then that's for Kabbalah Shabbos. Or if you launder your clothing on Thursday, uh, they used to do the clothing laundering on Thursday so they'd have fresh clothes for Shabbos. They say this is for Kabbalah Shabbos. So cutting your nails, if you have to choose when to cut your nails, best to cut them on Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday for Kabbalah Shabbos. And that's why this is brought down in the halachas of Kabbalah Shabbos. Okay, then he says the funny part. Okay, so he says, what's the reason for the mnemonic of kashya bloterots of a difficulty without a resolution? He says, this is teaching you, or it's alluding to the fact that the reason for this order of cutting your fingernails is difficult, and you can't ask why because there's no answer. <laughs> okay, so he's acknowledging that like, yeah, this is how we do it, but you can't ask why because we, we won't have an answer. Okay, then he spreads a rumor, okay? Rumor is, Vishamati, I heard, Vishem Chachmei Tsarfas u Provencia. I heard from the, the Chachamim of France and Provence. Okay, now Provence is in France, but I don't know what the lines were in the 14th century. Shahnoto Tsipurn of Kaseder, that if you cut your fingernails in sequence, okay, meaning like in order, Kasha, then this will make it difficult for you in terms of la'anius, poverty, shikacha, forgetfulness, and kavor banim, and burying your children. Okay, which means that if you cut your fingernails in order, then you're going to have, pro- you're going to become poor, then, and you're going to forget things, and your children are going to die young. Okay? And then he says, Ella noto osam al seder shamarna. Rather, you should cut them the way that I said. Okay, now, this is the Abu Dhirim in the 14th century. Okay. Um, so once I saw that that was the original source, I knew that this is not coming from Hasidus. Okay, so you can rule that out because Hasidus was, uh, was much later. This is not coming from the Ari, okay, from, the, from Lurianic Kabbalah, because that was in the 16th century. Okay, I think so. Let me just make sure. Um, Arizal. Okay, which is where a lot of these things come from. Uh, 16th century, okay. And the Zohar was... Uh, was you know uh, revealed, publicized, whatever you want to say, by Moshe de Leon in twelve forty to thirteen oh five, and the Abu Dhiram died. Oops, Abu Dhiram died in thirteen forty. So it's possible that this can come from the Zohar. But the funny thing is that he does not quote the Zohar. He quotes the Chachamim of France and Provencia, who were before that. Okay, so it does not seem like this comes from the Zohar. Um, Okay, does anyone know where it might have come from if it came from, actually, no, that's too, too loaded of a question. Okay, and here's the thing is, I looked through all of the Akronim and Postkim. I think I looked through all of them, at least on Bar Ilan, I did a search. All of them just quote the Abu Dhiram. Okay, so I was convinced that this is the earliest source, but I was curious, who is he referring to when he says the Chachme um, Sarfas and Provatia? So one of my friends uh, sent me a, an order, uh, a, 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 sorry, an article from Chabad.org by a Rebbe Yehuda Sherpin, who says, why do Jews cut their fingernails out of order? And the paragraph opens as follows. There is indeed an ancient custom of not cutting nails sequentially. The earliest mention seems to be in a version of Masechus Kala. Okay, anyone know what Masechus Kala is? I'm curious how well known that is. Okay, so there are these things. So we know that what, uh, Masechtos are the tractates of the Talmud, uh, of, of the Mishnah, really, okay? Um, but there are things called, okay, so in the, the Masechta, sorry, in the Talmud, you've got Talmud Yushami, which was the first one written, then Talmud Bavli, then Masechtos Katanos, small Masechtas, uh, and they were written in different time periods from the end of the Gemara through the Savarayim, which are the editors of the Gemara. So we're talking like 6th century through like the 10th century, maybe, okay? So really early on, Gaonic or Savarayic uh, works, so he says, um, the earliest mention seems to be in a version of Masechus Kala quoted by Mahzor Vitri, written by Rav Simcha ben Shmuel of Vitri, who passed away in 1105, the same year as his teacher, Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki, otherwise known as Rashi. 
Okay, so this is, Rashi had several prominent students and the Mahzor Vitri was one of his prominent students. And he says, there we are told that one should be careful not to cut his nails in order since it can bring forgetfulness, poverty and premature death of one's children. Okay, so now we're dealing with something that's a good 200 years before the Abu Dhiram. Okay, and not from an area that was influenced by Zohar because this was 200 years before the Zohar. Okay, so, so the question though is like, where did, where did he get it from? So it, the reason why this article says from a version of Masechah's Kala is because our Masechah's Kalas that we have don't have this in it, but apparently his version did. So I did, again, you got to do your research. So I looked through Masech, uh, the Mahzor Vitri and I did all these searches. I did dozens of searches, could not find it in Mahzor Vitri. Okay, so now I'm wondering, is this a fake source? Because sometimes there are fake sources. So then I asked, I emailed the author of Chabad.org and I said, can you show me your source? So he sent me the source and here's the source, okay? Uh, in the Mahzor Vitri, which is uh, Simon Tuf Kuf Chavtes, which is not in my Mahzor Vitri because my Mahzor Vitri only has to do with the tefillah stuff. And I still can't find a hard copy of this. I got this on Barilan. Someone cuts his fingernails, bismol on the left hand, maska bakamita umusayim bagoda. You start with the ring finger and end with the thumb. Okay, which, which, um, okay, he'll say, ubi min, and on the right hand, maska bagoda. So he also has different than the Ramah. You start with the thumb, umusayim bakamita, and you end with the ring finger. Velo shtaim zo You should not cut two in sequence, mipne shakasha lashikaka, because that'll cause you to forget stuff. Velo ba'ama, you should not start with the ring finger because that will cause you to bury your children. You should not start with the... Um, Zeris is the... Hold on, I'm forgetting now. Pinky. That's going to cause you to have difficulties with poverty. And not start with the pointer finger. That'll give you um, uh, uh, problems with reputation, bad reputation. Ella Bagoda Lukmita, you should start with the thumb and with the ring finger. Umisha Osinkane, Tishmor Dato, and someone who, who does this will preserve his mind. <laughs> okay, so that's the earliest source we have. Okay, and that's as far back as I can uh, uh, trace it. Okay, so now we have this thing, and we're now back to the original question, which is Sarah's question, which is the Ramah brings it down, is it in the Abu Dhiram? Okay, um, and, uh, and the Abu Dhiram got it from the Chachme Sarfas, which is possible that this is Rashi's student because the uh, Master Vitri lived in France, okay? And that's it. So it's not in the Gemara and it's not necessarily even in the Masachtos Katanos in all of them, or it's just in his, okay? So again, the question is, what do we do? Okay, do we have to keep this halakhically or not? So what would you say, just based on your knowledge? Uh, you, let's say, you're, let's say you, you're, you find the, the same circumstance that Sarah and Rifti find. You're reading a halakha book and you find this in the Ramah. Okay, what do you do? What would you do? Like in a practical sense? Yeah, practical sense. I, I would ask a POSIC. I don't know. Ask a POSIC. Okay, so that's what I did. Okay. So I asked my POSIC and my POSIC sent me the Aruch HaShokha. Now I'm, I'm happy about that because when I am, am following Halacha and I'm not relying on, on my own POSIC, like I'm just looking at the Halacha, Aruch HaShokha is my, uh, my go-to. And there are reasons that, you know, there's a debate about whether you should, you know, Who's the better one to rely on, the Aruch HaShulchan or the Mishnah Brura? Um, the arguments for relying on the Aruch HaShulchan, I'm just going to read this because I think this should be more well-known. Aruch HaShulchan versus Mishnah Brura. This is an article, a very short article by um, Rabbi Ari Enkin. Um, he says that... Um, uh, he says, although not completely accurate, perhaps the state, state, state of affairs can be summarized as follows. The yeshivish world follows the Mishnah Brewer almost exclusively, while much of the learned non-yeshivish world defers to the Aruch HaShulchan. This is quite odd, considering that the Aruch HaShulchan is a Lithuanian work, while the Mishnah Brewer is a Polish one. Uh, while I, I certainly don't want to marginalize the Mishnah Brewer, I would, however, like to discuss why the Aruch HaShulchan should be considered the Posik Acheron in a dispute between it and the Mishnah Brewer. A uh, very short article. I'm just going to read the rest of it. The Aruch HaShulchan is probably the most thorough and conveniently organized compilation of halakha today. Every halakha issue opens with a presentation of the relevant scriptural and Talmudic sources. So too, unlike the Mishnah Berurah's text-based tradition to deciding halakha, the Aruch HaShulchan tries to determine the halakha based on Talmudic precedents and contemporary practice, and often works hard to satisfy both. Okay, so in other words, um, the Mishnah Berurah would paskin based on an analysis of the text alone, whereas the Aruch HaShulchan would Paskin based on precedent in the Gemara and, and like the current Minhag. It's not since the Rambam that there's been a work of halacha that covers all of Jewish law like the Aruch HaShulchan does. And that's true. The Mishnah Brewer is only on 
Orach Chaim, which is one of the four sections of the Shulchan Aruch, um, and the Aruch Shulchan is on all of Halacha. Okay, so which shall we follow? Mishnah Bur Aruch Shulchan. Rav Yehuda Henkin cites his grandfather, Rav Yosef Eliyahu Henkin, as having ruled that the Aruch Shulchan is the most definitive and authoritative decisor of Halacha. He offers a number of reasons for this. One reason is because most of the Aruch Shulchan was written after the Mishnah Brura. In fact, the Aruch Shulchan often cites the Mishnah Brura before issuing his own ruling. Another reason why the Aruch Shulchan would, should be considered more authoritative is because it covers the entire Shulchan Aruch, while the Mishnah Brura only covers the Aruch Haim section. So too, as mentioned, the Aruch Shulchan also takes into account the common customs of his day before rendering a ruling. Finally, the Mishnah Brura was essentially written by a scholar while the Aruch Shulchan was written by a scholar who was also a practicing rabbi. And that's a very, very big uh, uh, difference. As a practicing rabbi, the, ar- the author regularly interacted with the community and dealt with the problems and issues that they faced. He had more hands-on experience in dealing with halakhic dilemmas. Indeed, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein is reported to have said that the Aruch Shulchan takes precedence over the Mishnah Brewer for, for this reason alone. Okay, so that's what um, a lot of posts can say. Rav Herschel Schachter, who's considered by many to be the greatest posek in the modern Orthodox world now, does not like the Aruch Shulchan for several reasons, which I've heard. Uh, so like, you know, this is not by any means a definitive thing, but I like the Aruch Shulchan. And when I asked uh, my posik, he referred me to the Aruch Shulchan. So let's read what the Aruch Shulchan says. Okay, and then we'll get into the more theoretical meta halakhic part of the shir. Okay, so he says, Yish, so this is in Reish Samech. Yesh Shikasvu al Pitzavas Rav Yehuda HaChasid uh, so he says the some say based on the command of Rabbi Yehuda HaChasid, that's the author, one of the authors of Sefer Hasidim, who was a book in the Rishonic era from the Hasidic Ashkenaz, the uh, German pietists, uh, not affiliated with the actual Hasidim nowadays. Um, he says not to cut your fingernails on Rosh Chodesh, or uh, even if it's if it falls out on Erev Shabbos, because of danger. Okay. Some people say don't cut your fingernails and toenails on the same day. Okay, this is another thing that I, I heard and I assume was superstitious. Okay, some say don't cut your fingernails on um, don't shave or cut your fingernails on Thursday. Okay, this is an interesting one. Because they start to grow on Shabbos. Okay, so so you don't want to grow stuff on Shabbos. Okay, the Zehu Negan Mishnah Mefureshes Petainis, but that goes against an open Mishnah in Tainis to Anche Mishmar Hayim Magalchim Biyom Chamishi that says that the the Kohanim who were on the rotation would shave on Thursday. Begam is it Isser who should mischilin ligado b'Shabbos? Also, what Isser would it be that if it's you 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 start to grow facial hair or or uh, fingernails on Shabbos? Ella dimipne kaver Shabbos nachon yoser least taver be'er Shabbos. Um, he says uh, it's better to, because of Kavod Shabbos, to uh, get your hair cut on Erev Shabbos. But if you know that there's not going to be enough time on Erev Shabbos, obviously you should shave and cut your fingernails on a Thursday. Now here's our part. They also write, You should not cut them in order. Um, you should start on the left hand with the ring finger, the right hand with the pointer finger. Okay, so that's like the Ramah says. Okay, now here's the funny part. Okay, so ready for this? So we were wondering what is the Kabbalistic practice? So he says, So he wrote that the Arizal was not careful about this. And not only that, he would mock it. Okay, so the Arizal, who is considered to be like one of the great you know, mystics did not hold by this and he even mocked it. Okay. Um, but the Magin of Ram says, nevertheless, it is proper to be careful. Okay. So now here's, so, so far he's just quoting other people. Now he says his opinion, and this is what my posik was referring to. He, he told me this line. All of these things, none of them have any place within the jurisdiction of halacha. Uman de kapid kapid with low copy low copy. People who care about this should care about it, and people who don't care about it should not care about it. Okay, so that was the psak that I got. Okay, but so I was happy on the one hand. I'm oh, sorry, and Viyakut. Um, oh yeah, fine. Yeah, so that, that's what he says. Okay, and he goes on for more more fingernail stuff. Okay, so, um, so personally, I was happy about this because, like, you know, I I, I was not mafia on this halakha, and frankly, it seems crazy, right? Especially if you looked at that. Um, the uh at the mox or vitri that if you you're telling me that if i cut my um my fingers 
in fingernails in order, I'm going to forget. And if I cut my middle fingernail first, I'm going to have premature deaths of children. And if I cut my pinky, I'm going to become poor. And if I cut my, my pointer finger, then it's going to be bad for my reputation. Like that sounds crazy. Okay. But now again, the question is like, what do you do? So it's nice here. He says that, um, that, uh, that like, we don't care about this. Okay. However, he then goes on and brings uh, another halacha. Okay. Which is, I'm going to actually show you the Gemara about this. Um, uh, Okay, actually, you know what? We'll go. We'll go with this later. Uh, all right. How many of you have heard the thing about um, fingernails and pregnant women? And if you if you have, then uh, yeah. Uh, anyone want, want to say what it is? What you've heard? Yes, Mar. Um, I heard a sheer on this actually, but it was that um, that if you the the statement was that if you cut your fingernails and a pregnant woman steps on it, then she'll yeah. have a miscarriage. Right. Correct. Okay, good. So that's actually a Gemara. Okay. So the Gemara says, and, and the, the, uh, the Arkha Shogun quotes, he says, um, Amrusham, Shatipur Naim, Chasid Sorfan, Sadi Kovran, Varasha Zorkan. So with your fingernails, if you're pious, you'll burn them. If you're Tzadik, you'll bury them. And if you're a Russia, you'll just throw them wherever they are. Okay. So that, and, and then the reason given is because if a pregnant woman steps on them, then she'll have a miscarriage. Okay. Uh, I'll ask you later on in this year what you uh, heard the explanation for that is. But then he says, to hold rhyme elu, oh, sorry, he says, um, everything Chazal said is entirely reliable. These are things that are segulas. Okay, segulas are the, okay, segula literally means like a treasured thing. But uh, people, you know, treat segulas as like, you know, almost like good luck charms, you know, or like bad luck charms. And he says that they are hidden from the way, the nature of the intellect. Okay, but that's a separate thing. So the funny thing is he says, the reason why we don't care about the, um, the uh, order of the fingernails is because Chazal didn't bring it down. But Chazal, if Chazal did bring it down, you know, like the, finger, the, the, the fingernail pregnancy thing, then we should believe them even though we don't understand it. Okay, so now we're back to square one, which is how do you know which things, I mean, again, you should always ask your POSIC, right? But let's say you don't have access to your POSIC. How do you know which things that are brought down in halacha you should believe and which ones you shouldn't? Okay, so that's the meta halacha question on the table here. Okay, and how do the post game know, all right? And especially with things that have to do with danger, because that's what we're dealing with here. Is, and there's a principle that says um, sakanta mi isura, that danger is more machmir than isur. And the easiest case, I, I didn't, uh, I think this is said somewhere in halacha, I just didn't bring down the source, is, um, you know, what's the halacha if a non-kosher substance falls into a kosher thing? Okay, I mean, I know there's a lot of halachas, but generally speaking, in most cases, we say batabashishim, right? It's negated in 60. But let's say poison falls into uh, something. So we don't say it's batabashishim, right? Is we go based on like the dangers, you know? And there are also cases where, um, you know, if there is a minority, um, like a small chance of danger, then we say that it's also for everyone to do. Okay. So the question is like, how do you evaluate these things? Okay. So thankfully, I found uh, in Shiles and Shuvas of this Mishneh Halachos, which is written by a 20th century Posek who died in 2011. He brings down these questions, and the, the question is, that he's dealing with in Shuvah, it's a very long Shuvah, he says, Lama hishmitu a poskim harbe mishim skana. So he says, the Gemara has tons of things that are usher because of danger, and the poskim don't bring them all down. Some of them they do, some of them they don't. And his answer I really like. Okay, he brings down several answers. Some of them I think are, are absolutely uh, irrational, which I'll, I'll quote to you in a second. But he starts off with an answer that, that makes a lot of sense. He says, so there's a Shaila and Chuba of the Rashba, which I could not track down in time for Shear. And the Rashba was a, a, a Rishon, I think the, the most prolific Rishon. He writes that the majority, sorry, he says all of the types of medicine that were practiced by Chazal, he says we should not follow those remedies now. We should only follow those remedies that are vouched for by the scientists and the doctors. And according to that, so now the Mishnah Halachos is saying, since we don't make use of the remedies of Chazal in the Gemara, 
So too, she'ain anu, sorry, because we're not experts in them, plenty of reason. Hakanami, so too here, so too with things that Chazal said were dangerous. We don't have any knowledge of that. And things that we, we do have knowledge of, there we should be uh, careful and do them. Uh, uh, we should remember them and do them. And this is really up to the Chachamim of the generation to assess. And this is very fits very much in line with my whole approach to science, okay? Which uh, and 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 Chazal, which is you know has its roots in many Rishonim and and uh, and Gaonim uh, and Achronim. Which if you need a list, look up on uh, on uh, Rabbi Nelson Slifkin's site. He has all the sources, okay? But my favorite summary of this is in Rav Hirsch's letters on Agadita, letter number four. Okay, Rav Hirsch is in the nineteenth century. He says. In my opinion, the first principle that every student of Chazal's statements must keep before his eyes is the following. Chazal were sages of God's law, the receivers, transmitters, and teachers of his Torahs, his mitzvahs, and his interpersonal laws. They did not especially master the natural sciences, geometry, astronomy, or medicine, except insofar as they needed them for knowing, observing, and fulfilling the Torah. We do not find that this knowledge was transmitted to them from Sinai. Nowadays, too, so that's point number one, is that all of the um, halachos are based on Masora. But science, geometry, astronomy, medicine, that you'll find in the Gemara is not based on any Masora. Okay, not based on Nevi'im, not based on Moshe Rabbeim, not based on God. Nowadays, too, it is enough for the non-specialists to know about any of these areas of knowledge, whatever contemporary experts teach that is generally accepted as true. This applies to the lawyer vis-a-vis -vis all other areas, to the mathematician and the astronomer regarding the natural sciences, and to the expert on flora regarding all other areas. We expect none of them to seek out the truth and satisfy his inclinations in any field other than his own specialty. So he's saying this is how specialties work. You know, you specialize in your area, you're an expert there, but you're not a specialty in the other areas, so you rely on those experts. Moreover, even in the area where one is an expert, it is neither possible for him nor expected of him to know everything through personal investigation and experience. Most of his knowledge rests upon the investigation of others. If they have erred, it is not his fault. It is sufficient and praiseworthy of his knowledge encompasses all that is accepted as true at his time and place and generation. The greatness of his wisdom is in no way belittled if in a later generation it is discovered that some of the things he maintained or accepted on the authority of the others are unreliable. The same is true for Chazal in these areas. The greatest of them knew all the wisdom and science of all the great non-Jewish scholars of whose wisdom and teachings became famous in their generations. So in other words, if Chazal it turns out if we find out that Chazal got something wrong, that's not a degradation to them. They were holding, you know, in the current science of their times, just like we are now, and just like what we believe to be scientifically true is going to look ridiculous in 50 or 100 years, so too, you know, but we are, we are rational to rely on the science of our times, so too Chazal were relying on the science of their times, and they were wrong, but that's not an insult to them, okay? So, so what the Mishnah Halachos is saying is when it comes to evaluating these, uh, the, uh, these dangers, you have to rely on the scientists of your times, okay? Now that is his good reason. I just want to quote to you what I think is his absolutely bad, foolish reasons, okay? Uh, which he mentions as other possibilities. One is an answer that, that is frequently given by certain Jews, Nishtanu HaTavayim, that nature changed, okay? This is an answer given that Cutting your fingernails used to be dangerous, but then there were changes in the laws of nature and now cutting your fingernails is not dangerous, okay? I think that's ridiculous because nature doesn't change, okay? The only thing you could say about nature changing is maybe certain things environmentally, you know, are different. Uh, you know, let, let's say like I was learning this with uh, one of my uh, Talmudim and he said like, you know, in the olden days, you know, um, you know, the, you know, uh, where malaria was extremely common everywhere. So then like, you know, maybe you had to be careful about certain things because of malaria and they didn't understand what malaria um, was. What is, okay, we, we know now malaria is transmitted by mosquitoes, but what did they think malaria was trans, uh, transmitted by? And the hint is in the word. Bad air, right? Bad air, right? Mal is bad one. and area is like, is, uh, is from air, I think. So, um, so they thought malaria was like something in the air. And so maybe they thought about a bunch of stuff, but now we, we know that it's, it's transmitted by mosquitoes. And if there are are no mosquitoes in a certain area, maybe then things are different, okay? But it's not like nature changed about fingernails. Another answer he gives is Kevin didashu be rabim shomer pasayim Hashem. Now, this should be its own shear, but there, he, I, I, there's a principle apparently in halacha that says, if something is violated by many people, then we say shomer pasayim Hashem. Hashem protects simpletons, okay? I have enough of a problem with what it means Hashem protects simpletons uh, because all of Mishle is directed at teaching simpletons to use Chachma so they don't have like bad consequences. So like, what does it mean Hashem protects simpletons? That's another answer he gives. The most ludicrous answer he gives, and I'm saying ludicrous even though this is a post, like, I think this is an absolutely insane answer, is he says, 
the Rambam, he says the Shulchan Aruch didn't bring this down because the Shulchan Aruch followed the Rambam, okay? And the Rambam does not hold by superstitious things, okay? But really, the Rambam did hold by superstitious things secretly, and he only wrote that he didn't hold by all the superstitious things because he didn't want people to get caught up in the Arabic superstitions of his time. So he wrote the whole, all the statements against superstition in the Mishnah Torah and in the Mor Nebuchim. Um, he wrote, like the Rambam, like frame, portrayed himself as this rationalist because he didn't want people to be sucked into the Arab of Odazara. And really the Rambam believed in all these things. And that's why he didn't write them. And then the Shulchan Aruch was going based on the Rambam. And since people are following the Shulchan Aruch, then God will protect them because now most people ignore these things and God protects simpletons. And then he gives an even crazier answer, which is he says that, that a posik has the, the ability to change nature by posking certain shilas in certain ways, okay? And I've, I've heard of this in the, um, the uh, Akiva Tats, uh, Rabbi Akiva Tats' Teenager's Guide to Judaism or whatever, gives this case where he says that like, there's some story, oh, maybe I have it here, no, I'm not going to quote it. He has a story where like, like this, this guy came to a rabbi and had like a lung disease and the rabbi said, you're definitely going to live. And then he lived and the rabbi, uh, and the guy said like, how did you know? He says, because, because you're an Ashkenazic and you follow the Ramah and the Ramah poskins that if an animal has this disease, then he's not a trefa, but the Shulchan Arach poskins for Spartan that the animal is a trefa. Trefa means that, that the animal is going to die of the disease. And so I knew that, that, Psaq creates reality and like you're not going to die. And so since the Ramam didn't bring these down la then that changed reality. Absolutely ludicrous answer. I don't think I need to elaborate on it, but I do like this other answer, which is you should rely on the scientists. Okay. So um, that is the uh, the meta halakhic consideration uh, number one. Okay. So I'll stop here if anyone has any questions on this because there's there's one more phase, two more phases of this year. Okay, I'm sorry this is not the most participatory share, by the way. I, I was kind of hoping that people would have uh, questions and, and that would be otherwise. Yeah, uh, uh, Yael? Um, from what the, rem the Ramasta initially didn't sound like the cutting the nails thing was based on danger. It sounded like Kavok Chavez, right? Correct. So I'm misremembering. Right. right. So does so, it doesn't matter that. Okay, good question. So the interesting thing is in the Ramah, in the Shukhan Arach, he doesn't bring down danger and he puts it in the context of, of uh, Kavok Chavez. But the Ramah's original source is in the um, uh, what do you call it? Is uh, he is in the Darche um, Moshe on the tour, which is in a different simon, and he quotes the Abu Dhiram, and he does bring down the danger thing there, and the Abu Dhiram brings on the danger thing, you know. So, so I, I don't know if there's like rules about the Ramah about like um, which one you take to be more definitive. My guess is just like the base Yosef, you take to be more definitive than the Shulchan Aruch because the Shulchan Aruch was just a summary and the base Yosef was his actual work. So to the Dark and Moshe his, is his actual work and his actual reasoning. And the Ramah is just his summaries. Uh, that's, that is a good question though. Okay. Yes, Alex. Um, I have a question that's like slightly related. Yeah. But, um, so I remember in the past uh, hearing uh, re like halachas with nails that you're not supposed to cut your nails at night. And I was just curious if that was something when you were like researching into this. So if I, I, you know, I, I, I was on the lookout just for this nail cutting thing, but I did not, so it's possible I missed it. I did not see anything about cutting your nails at night, but I think there you can say that there is a real danger, which is that you're gonna like cut your finger by mistake. You know, like you remember, there were no nail clipping cl clippers and there was not electric light, you know? So like that would be a, um, uh, a possible uh, reason if that were a thing. I just didn't see it. Okay, so now I want to show you though, how did the Rambam deal with these things? Okay, because again, the Mishnah Halachos is correct. The Rambam omitted many things that were brought down in Shas uh, as dangerous. And the question is, how did the Rambam make these, uh, these um, decisions? Hold on just a second. Get, uh, here's our commercial break. Um, a book I highly recommend, which is unfortunately no longer in print and therefore it's more expensive is this book called Without Red Strings or Holy Water, Maimonides Mishnah Torah by H. Norman Strickman, okay? Um, H. Norman Strickman is known primarily for being the English translator of the Ibn Ezra, okay? But he wrote this book on the Ramam. And this is basically a book about what the Ramam's Mishnah Torah did and about how the Ramam's Mishnah Torah um, was instrumental in purging Judaism from many of its mystical and superstitious elements. Okay, so he has a whole chapter on things that are, are us or because of danger. And uh, I want to quote here what he says. He says, 
Um, uh, the Talmud discusses practices which were considered harmful and thus prohibited. The Talmud rules that something dangerous is to be treated with greater stringency than something that is prohibited. Uh, that was what I mentioned uh, is a chamira uh, sakantem uh, isura, that danger is more strict than, uh, than uh, iser. The problem that Maimonides faced was that he was convinced that some of the practices which the Talmud considered harmful were in actuality not so. Maimonides dealt with this difficulty as follows. When these dangerous practices had moral or halakhic import, Maimonides codified the rabbinic dictum, but omitted or reinterpreted the reason for it. Okay, so this is what we call like reclaiming practices. Okay, so he preserved it in halakha, but gave a different reason for it. Okay, we'll see examples in a second. And then approach number B, Maimonides ignored these dangerous practices when they had no moral or halakhic import. Okay, so I'm gonna go through four examples, which I got from, uh, from this book, uh, but I just brought down the actual sources. So the Gemara Pesachim says, So uh, the Gemara says, if you have uh, marital relations by light of a candle, okay, like with, when there's a candle in the room, your, your kids are going to turn out to be epileptic, okay, like they're going to have seizures, okay? And the Gemara says that like as a, an actual like, um, like medical thing, okay? So the Ramam does bring this down, but look how the Ramam brings it down. In Sefer Kedusha, Hilchosi Suri Bia, Okay, in the laws of, uh, of um, uh, the Book of Holiness and the Mishnah Torah, in the laws of prohibited relations, 2110, it's also for a person to have relations by candlelight. Hari Shahisa Lele Shabbos, if it was Shabbos night, Velohayalo Bias Acher, and you don't have another house, by Haner Dolik, and the candle is lit, then you should not have relations at all. Because back then, remember, you didn't have like many rooms. So like you'd often be in a place where like you have a candlelight and it's Friday night. Okay. It's also usher for a Jew to have marital relations by day because it's considered a brazen act. And if he was a Talmud Chachamim, okay, uh, and he's not going to become addicted to doing this, then he can uh, make it darker with a garment on the light, um, or sorry, on the window, and he can have relations. Um, but we only, um, uh, we only like allow him to do this if there's a tremendous need. It's a way of Kedusha to have relations in the middle of the night, okay? But I actually, you know, should have brought more halachos here. The context, let me just bring a few more halachos just so you can see the context. You could probably got it by now, but um, uh, the question you should be asking yourself is, um, how is the Ramam reclaiming this halacha? Um, hold on, Isra Bia 21. Uh, so he also says after that, what did I say? 21, 10. So he says, um, yeah, oh, hold on a second. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah. Ain das chacham minocha al mi shehu marbe b'tashim shemita v'hi matu etel ishto tami katarnagolin. So he says, um, uh, the chacham were not happy with someone who had so many marital relations a person who has so many marital relations that he's like a, a rooster with chickens where he's just like having constant relations. Uh, and he says, um, That's a very, very bad flaw. And it's an action of like boors. The, 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 the fewer one has relations, the, the more praiseworthy. But he has to keep up his obligations to his wife, right? Ona, that his wife can demand relations whenever uh, she, she wants, uh, when she's not Anita. Okay, he has to, you know, uh, he has to um, follow his wife's preferences. Okay, fine, that's a separate thing. The Chachamim also prohibited a person from having relations with his wife while he's thinking of another woman. He shouldn't have relations when he's drunk. And not when he and his wife are fighting. And not when he is in a state of hatred. Uh, he shouldn't go uh, uh, have relations with her against her will. Or if she is afraid of him. Uh, okay, so he's going through all these things. Okay, so what's the context in which the Raman was putting this halacha of the epilepsy? Like general proper conduct in this area? Yeah, general proper conduct in the matters of, of, of sexual uh, behavior, right? So, so he is codifying the halacha but completely discarding the reason, okay? Um, and like, if he really cared about the reason, he would put it in Hilchos Deus chapter four, which is about health practices, 
Okay, or he would put it in Hilchos Rotech or Shmiras Hanefesh, which is about dangerous practices. You know, but he puts it in the realm of sexual ethics. Okay, so that's one example. Here's another example. Um, it says in the Gemara Pesachim Daf Kufiud Beis Amud Aleph. Oh, that by the way, that um, uh, that last halacha was in Kufiud Pesachim Kufiud Beis Amud Beis. So this is in uh, Amud Aleph. Ochli Numashkin Tachas Amita. If you have food or beverages under your bed, even if it's sealed in iron, which is their equivalent of Tupperware, then an evil spirit rests upon them. Okay, now we're not going to go into what evil spirits are, but there were Chachamim who held evil spirits are like, you know, like spirit spirits, okay? Like evil, evil spirits, okay? Like demons or whatever. Okay, so the Raman brings down this halacha. But where does he bring it down? In Hilchos Rotei Hoshmir Senefesh 12.5, which is about dangerous things. And here's the context. He put, shouldn't put his hand under his armpit. Shema nagab yado b'metzora o basam ra. Oh, sorry. Is it someone else's armpit? I don't know. Because he says maybe he'll touch metzora or he'll touch uh, something that's like um, toxic. Shall you die maskanios? Because uh, hands are busy. Okay, I don't know exactly what he means, but he says, hatav shil takas amita. You shouldn't put food under your bed. Osig even if you are involved in your suda. I mean, you shouldn't even put it there while you're like, you know, not just not storing it there, but you shouldn't even put it there temporarily. Shema yipol bo davar hamazik. Maybe something dangerous will fall into it. Who you know, and you won't see it. It's like maybe like a black widow will like drop into it or whatever and ex- ex- excrete its venom. You know. So again, he doesn't say ruach ra. He just says something harmful. Okay, so that's an example of reclaiming this and putting it either in, in for a moral reason uh, or for an actual uh, danger that he actually believed in, okay, the, based on, on, uh, on the evidence. Okay, now here's another example. This is one we quoted from before. Um, it says in Moikatan Yurchas Amud Aleph, three things are said by fingernails. Hakovran uh, Tzadik, one who buries them is a tzaddik. Sorfan chasid, someone who burns them is a chasid. Vizorkan rasha. If you throw them, you're a rasha. Time am I? What's the reason? Shema tavor alein isha ubara v'tapil. Maybe a pregnant woman will, will step over them and then have a miscarriage. Uh, so then it says, uh, I think I accidentally omitted something here. Uh, so there, there was a case where Rabbi Yochanan used to cut his fingernails in the base midrash, and they say, how could he do that? And he wouldn't throw his fingernails away. So he says, Isha uh, midrash lo shlicha. It wasn't common to have women in the base midrash. Um, and uh, okay, fine, yeah. So the Ramam does not bring that one down at all, okay? Because he held there's no actual danger, and there's no way you can make this into a morality thing, okay? Uh, now I did hear someone say that. Um, well, actually, maybe this is a good place to ask uh, Tamar or anyone else who's heard of an explanation. So, has, uh, uh, Tamar, do you recall what the explanation was, if the if explanation was given for the fingernail thing? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I, I think what, this is from Rabbi Fader. Um, I think what yeah. he said was that, I think he was, uh, first he was like pointing out that they didn't have nail clippers and mm-hmm it seems possible likely that the fingernails that they're they're cutting their fingernails was a lot sharper yeah so that's the first thing that it was like okay. and basically basically i think he was explaining it that it was like actually a hazard ah uh, interesting okay that it would be like, like actually distressing painful injur- injurious okay. to step on them yeah okay that's definitely possible yeah anyone else have any uh things you've heard or ideas yeah i've also heard that like after yeah. you die to, after you die to like get your body prepared, they would cut your nails in order. And so we shouldn't do it. Ah, in order. Okay. So, like, so, okay. So, th- yeah. so that's what I expected to find, right? So I expected to find, I've heard that that's the reason for not cutting your nails in order and also not cutting your, no- your, your uh, nails and your, your fingernails and toenails on the same day. I did not find that about the cutting your fingernails in order, which was shocking to me because that's, that was what I heard. And that's also why I assumed it was superstitious, you know? Um, but, uh, but the, the nails on and fingernails and toenails on the same day, I think I did see that. For that yeah but i'm wondering more about the the woman with the uh the the pregnant woman thing yeah ayala so i more of a question sure. um about all of those cases i've heard a lot of like interpretations i think i've heard my dad like teach these a bunch of times and like explaining chazals like talking about either like rah, rah, or whatever or yeah. these like super nine type of things and like explaining like how that could have been dangerous when they didn't have like some of the practices that we have yeah um so do you think that the rambam 
would like is recognizing that but saying well that's not applicable or like yeah i guess that's the question uh that the ramam is recognizing that they had different practices or like that it would have been dangerous in their time like something about like actual actually physically dangerous like that's just always what i assumed that it meant yeah so it's definitely possible that in certain cases the Ramam held that way, but I think in the cases where it's talking about Ruach Ra or Shadim and the Ramam doesn't bring it down, I think it's because he doesn't believe in Shadim, you know? Um, so like, I think there's, there's probably like a variety there. Yeah. Um, I'll give you one explanation I did hear about this, which is that, um, and I don't remember where I first heard this. It's possible I heard it from Jesse Fishbein. It's possible I heard it from Rabbi Mann or from someone else, which is that pregnant women um, are very sensitive to emotional um, like distress, uh, like if they get scared or if they laugh really hard or if they are like, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, a tragedy happens, like emotionally distressing things or they're grossed out, emotionally distressing things can like affect their hormones, affect the baby. I don't really know the modern science is. So m- m- this is my analogy, which is that there are people who get, who absolutely freak out if they find a hair in their food. Okay. And if they find a hair in, in like, if they take a bite of something that someone else prepared and there's a hair in it, they get like, they gag. Okay. Now I, I, I never quite understood that because I always thought to myself, like, like, I feel like if you're worried about, you know, a hair, worry about the hands of the waiter, like the hands of the waiter the, or, you know, that's like way more unsanitary than, than any of that, but whatever. I understand people freak out that way. My thought was that it's possible that, that pregnant women, related to fingernails that way you know i don't know if we relate to fingernails that way now but like that that it was their equivalent of that um and that's why we are uh, that that's why the uh Chazal made that statement another possibility is you know uh, i think the mishnah halachas brings this down also that says when Chazal made these decrees it was not always um a widespread thing sometimes they made this based on like one case that happened and the analogy now is like you know one woman um uh, you know, has her coffee spill on her lap in the drive-thru at McDonald's, and now all things have warning labels on them, you know, um, or one company gets sued because of one thing, and then they, they, they change all their policies, you know, so that's really how you have to think of this cause also, it's possible that, let's say, like, I, um, uh, Tamar's thing about how, like, maybe someone was cutting the fingernail, and it was actually sharp, and it cut a pregnant woman and got her infected or something, and then they made this uh, practice uh, standard, you know, so, so uh, what I want to say is, even though the Ramam didn't bring it down, can you apply the derech of the Rambam on your own to justify the practice of throwing away your fingernails? In other words, can we think of a, uh, a moral or a, uh, a halachic um, reason why you should throw away your fingernails, even though we know that they're not dangerous now? This is like a challenge for us. Yeah, Alex? Well, I mean... It's something I personally do. Like I always like flush my fingernails because the the feeling of uh like walking around barefoot if you step on a fingernail it's a very like it's like stepping on a Lego it hurts right yeah and yeah when you look like naturally when you step on something you're gonna look see like oh what was that sharp thing and then yeah. having it be like a fingernail body part is like just this really disgusting okay thing. yeah so, okay. I was going to mention it before you mentioned your part because I was like, I, I can see it being like, oh, it causes such intense disgust in pregnant women that it can cause issues. Okay, good, good. So, so you can, you can, you can definitely say that. And you know, when you said that, another example that came to my mind is I think it is absolutely disgusting. I mean, I guess I, this happened more like when I was in like the dorm or whatever. If you see a used band aid somewhere, like that, that, that's another thing that like just like, ugh, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, you have another idea? I don't know if it's another idea, but just taking it maybe a bit further like maybe the moral import is that you're sensitive to other people's like that's what i was thinking also discuss yeah right Uh, that's what i was thinking also is that that you can extend this whether to pregnant women or to people in general of like not leaving your discarded uh body parts around you know uh uh and uh and that the halacha of not doing it in order could be there to make you conscious of that fact you know, like, otherwise you're just going to cut your fingernails and just like, woo, you know, just like them go, let them go all over. But if it's within the halakhic system, then maybe you'll, you'll, you'll think of this. Okay. So the last step of this year that I want to do is I found one person who actually gives an explanation. So there's one question we haven't asked, which is why that order, right? You have the mocks of victory about not starting with certain things, but is there a reason for the order? And it sounds weird, right? Four, two, five, three, one, two, four, one, three, five. Okay. So the, um, 
I found this Shiloh Suchuvos. Okay, now again, a Shiloh Suchuvos is when you ask a, a post like a halakha question, okay? This has got to be up there with one of the most like minutia obsessed public uh, 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 questions I've ever heard. But look, I'm not faulting the guy. He, he's asking his posik. He says, oh, where is it? Oh, here he goes. He says, so this is the, um, I forgot who this is. Betzel HaChachma. I don't know who this is. So the question is like this. <laughs> um, so, so he says, um, The question is about someone who makes a mistake in cutting his fingernails in the order. So he quotes the Ramah, okay? And he says, the question is, what happens if you made a mistake uh, in the beginning and you started on your, your pinky, okay? Do you, so, so once you already messed it up, do you still care about the order or can you just go in order now? And if you do care about the order, so then what order are you supposed to do it in? Okay, that was the question that the guy, that the guy asked him. Okay, so first what he does is he brings down the post game who don't hold by this at all. Okay, he says, um, uh, so these post game, the Turi Zahav and the Magin Avram bring down that the Maharam and the Ari were not careful about this. Elisha Magin Avram, Mesik, uh, but the Magin of Ram, who's another ma major Ashkenazic posik, po concludes by saying, "Miu yesh li hizayir lechadchila." You should be careful lechadchila. Uv Eli Rava matik divrei Magin of Ram she yesh li hizayir lechadchila. Umosi if alav ki mi yishma lahakel rosh bechamira sakanta ushamashma bishvili emuna dafilu bishnei tiparnaim kasidran yesh sakanta. So um, the Eli Rava says, "Of course you should be careful because who would be so brazen as to be lenient on something that's dangerous?" And he says, "Even two fingernails in sequence is a danger." Uh, so from there you see that even if you make a mistake, you should still be careful. Okay, now this is a very long chuva, so I'm going to cut to the chase here. Okay, so he says um, that the reason is based on the following. He says, um, uh, I, I, I know this is Okay, so he says, um, uh, I, I know this is Kol pinascha sh'ata pone lo yihu ela derech yamin. All turnings that you do should only be to the right. Okay, so this is a universal principle in halakha, and there are many applications. So one is, I think the primary application is when you are in the, the uh, mikdash, there are certain things that you have to go around the mizbeach, and you should turn to the right, okay? You should go clockwise. Um, another thing, uh, I saw the Raman brings this down. I think the first place the Raman brings this down is in um, Birkas Kohanim. He says, um, thought I copied and pasted it here. Maybe I didn't. Okay, I guess I didn't bring it here. Uh, that when the Kohanim uh, turn like towards the people and then they, they turn away from the people with the Birkas Kohanim, they should turn to their right, okay? And then he brings a bunch of proofs. He says, a mock locus about whether turning to the right means going from left to right or right to left. And then he brings a bunch of proofs about um, about like the direction of the hand and whether this only applies to walking or only or only to the hand, but I'm, I'm going to omit all of that because I want to just get to the point here. Okay, so you should you, you should um, uh, cut your fingernails going to the right. Okay, so how does it work? So the goal, so you should think of this as like, if you're in programming, writing like a program or an algorithm, uh, and there are going to be, I think, three rules. Okay. One rule is that you always, you try to maximize the amount of times you go towards the right as possible. Okay. Second time is you, uh, the second rule is is as follows. He says, okay. You should not start with your um, your leftmost finger. You should start with your second finger uh, to, from the left. So that there should be a visible reminder that you're not you're not doing them in order. You should remove them to the right. Going from the left to the right. That's why you start on your left hand, and then you do your right hand. Because going rightward is always better because of the covet of your right. So, so, um, so hold on just a second here. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to summarize this verbally. Okay. So, so he basically says like this. 
you want to maximize the, the goings to the right, which means you're going to start from the left, which means you start from your left hand and the leftmost finger. But you can't start from your leftmost finger because that would be, uh, that would be um, what do you call it? Uh, looking like you're, st you're doing them in order. So you start with your, your ring finger and then you go to the right, but you can't go immediately to the right because we have this principle that you can't do them in order. So what happens? So you go ring finger, you go move to the right skipping. Okay, that's one right turn. Then you go back to the left and then you go to the right skipping and then to the right skipping. Then you go here, you don't start with your thumb because that looks like you're going in order. And you go with uh, index finger, then you go to the right skipping. Then you go back to leftmost and you go to the right skipping and the right skipping. Okay, so that's how he says it. So what would happen? So what do you think you should do? Okay, again, in this framework, what do you think you should do if you um, accidentally started by cutting your left finger now? What should you do? Skip one and then go to the Exactly, middle. right. So then let's see if I think he summarizes at the end. So if you accidentally cut your, your pinky nail on your left, so if this is on your left hand, you go three, five, two, four. And if you accidentally cut your right pinky first, two, four, one, three. So you should always go to the right because that's his answer to the question. But now our question is going to be, our remaining question is, so this is clearly not a moral issue, okay? But according to this explanation, you could say that if you do choose to hold by this halacha and you don't believe in the danger thing, and you, you also don't believe in that this is just to make you sensitive to, to people's discussing things, the question would be, what is the philosophical idea of turning to the right, okay? And once you get that idea, then whenever you cut your fingernails, you're now finding an additional way to incorporate the idea of going to the right into the cutting of your fingernails. And this is very reminiscent to the, um, to the halacha of your uh, putting on your shoes. Let me just show you this. Uh, this is not on my current blog, but on my old blog. Um, just one second, shoe tying. I'm just looking at the Gemara because I don't remember where it is. Um, yeah, hold on just a second here. So again, the halacha is, and I'm not saying whether you're, we're obligated to do this. That's a separate question. The Shulchan Aruch, though, says a person should put on his right shoe first without tying it. Then he should put on his left shoe and tie it. Then he should go back and tie his right shoe. So right shoe first, then left, then tie the left, and then tie the right. So where does that come from? So the Gemara says, Rabbi Yochanan said, just like a person puts on his tefillin, so too you should put on his shoes. Just as tefillin are on the left hand, so should you, too you should put on shoes beginning with the left shoe. They challenge this from a brysa. When a person puts on his shoes, he should put his right shoe on and first, uh, first, and then afterwards put on his left shoe. So then the Gemara reconciles it. Rabbi Yosef says, now that the Brisa has taught this and Rabbi Yochanan has taught that, the Avi Kumar Avid, the Avi Kumar Avid. So the first shita is you should do it whatever way you want. And then Rav Nachman or Yitzchak says, one who is Yerei Shemayim will fulfill both directives. And who was it that followed this? Mar Bar -ra -ra Rabana. How did he do this? He would put on his right shoe and not tie it, then put on his left shoe and tie it, and then he would tie his right shoe. So again, this, is, this should be a whole another shear. But the purpose of the shoe tying thing has nothing to do with shoes. It's to remind you of tefillin so that you could be thinking of your tefillin whenever you're putting on your shoes. And what that does also is like for most women don't put on tefillin, right? You can now associate to whatever ideas in tefillin when you put on your shoes, you know? So the question is, what is the philosophical idea of turning to the right? And if we find a good idea there, can we incorporate that into, into cutting your nails? Now, I tried looking into this you know, we know that there's a halakhic, basic halakhic thing of favoring the right side, okay? Um, so I, I, I have that, but I couldn't find any explanation of turning to the right. So does anyone have just any philosophical idea of either why we favor our right or why we turn to the right? Yeah, Tamar? Um, this is maybe a little like basic, I guess. Sure. But I would think that the idea of, of doing things with the right or favoring the right is just like it's the stronger side. Like you're right. using your stronger side to do stuff or you're putting your till in there yeah. or things like that. Yeah. Okay, right. Yeah, it's funny. Like, Tillin actually goes on the left because it's on the side of your heart. Uh, okay, yeah, is, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, I'll say, but you know, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, Ayala? I mean, I think this is very similar to what Tamar said, but just yeah. maybe like it's more hush of. So you want right. to serve Hashem with the most flesh of things. Exactly. Yeah. So I, that that's the best idea I have also, which is that you always want. So when it comes to doing mitzvos, 
you usually do the mitzvah with your right hand um, because uh, you're most, again, this is for right-handed people. If you're left-handed, then your left hand is your right hand. But for right-handed people, that is the most skilled, chashuv, important way uh, to do it. And you want to serve Hashem through the most skilled means possible because that's the way to, to have a couple to Hashem. Okay. Now, does is that the same idea as turning to the right? I'm not sure because there you're starting on the left and then moving rightward, you know? Um, now, I know that certain ideas are based on the mikdash. So, for example, um, yeah, see, I don't see that's the thing is, I don't know if this was unique to Mikdash and then we extrapolate from Mikdash outward or if this exists even independently from Mikdash. But I guess that that'll be like your your homework. Now, I'm not going to ask about this later on. But if anyone finds an explanation for why moving to the right is its own independent idea, then you can say that that is something you can think about when you're doing the fingernail thing. Yeah, Tamar. Um, this is maybe going back to sort of the beginning, but the. Sure. Um, so when we were saying these these statements like about you know if you if you cut your nails in such and such order you'll be poor or your other thing you'll forget things or things like right. that, um, I I would have interpreted that to mean something like I would have guessed without actually learning it that the the it would mean something like like there's some uh, concept or mita or something that you're bringing yeah. out by cutting your nails in a certain way and that's going to be related to these other things. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I don't know. It seems like we didn't go that route. So right, we didn't go that. Yeah. Okay, so that's a good question. So so there are a lot of statements of Chazal that are the same style. Like um, I'll give you a positive one. Like it says uh, Hanukkah is coming up, right? Someone who's careful with ner, and I think it, they say either ner Shabbos or ner Hanukkah. Uh, you're going to have children who are tamid chachamim. You know, so that can be explained philosophically or ethically. Uh, and I don't remember what the idea is. So tomorrow's saying, well, why didn't we say that here? Why don't we take that approach here? So. I did try to take that approach until I saw the Machzor Vitri, where he, you know, he says that, actually, sorry, that's not true. The Machzor Vitri is what prompted me to, to try to take that approach, which is like, you know, I, I had this idea of like, why is the pointer finger, if you start with your pointer finger, then you're going to get um, a bad reputation. So there's a Navi that says that Claw Israel um, was, instead of being involved in uh, helping the poor, they were accused of, they, they were, um, involved in finger pointing, which is basically just like, like trying to like make accusations of each other. You know, I couldn't work out an approach, but I did try. But the real reason why I don't think that that's the approach here is because if you read the sources, it really does seem like they thought that this was an actual danger. And if you were to take that approach, it would be the way that we just tried to do for the, uh, for the fingernail thing, which is you're, you're not claiming that this is what Hazal held. You know, they held that this was dangerous, but you're trying to come up with some post facto justification based on a philosophical idea that you can come up with. And if you can do that, then Hari Zayn Meshubach, and that's a good, a good idea. Um, yeah. Uh, Yala? Oop, you're on mute. I accidentally put my hand down. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I think another idea, which I heard about the shoelace thing, yeah. is like, I think something about like, it's a Midas Hasidim, and like, doing everything with intention and I guess specifically the right first is another right. idea but like do you think there's any role of that of like even cutting your fingernails which is the most mundane act you're yeah. being intentional about well, I, I've heard people say that as well but I don't I think that's kind of like the answer you know when people you know the the, the, the classic cliche thing is when someone asks a question about the Haggadah or, or about Seder and they say oh what's the reason for this it's to get the children to ask you know um like it is um uh, I, I think the question would be like, I mean, there are a lot of things you could do mindfully. Like, is that why the post game like codified it? You know, like it's to me, it seems like a, a very weak, like a, a God of the gaps type answer where you, you just like plug in something when you have a, a question mark. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not inclined to say that. It, it, now, again, you could do it as a post facto reason that like it'll make you mindful if you like don't just cut your nails mindlessly. But I don't think that is the reason it was instituted. Yeah, Alex. Um, there's a potential way you could look at it as being a way of staying mindful so, uh, so you don't like fall into danger because like if you, you cut your nails kind of absentmindedly in order you're more likely to cut them improperly and have like jagged edges you could scratch people with right, right, right so right. if you like uh create like a disruption to that routine you might you know go right. into it with more intention and, and right. be more careful yeah so i think with all of these types of explanations i think these are totally fine 
as long as you are making the line between realizing this is not why the Rishonim did it or why Chazal did it, this is a, a, a post facto reason, okay? Um, like, and I think once you do that, then that's fine. And you see, again, you see that the Ramam tried to justify these practices whenever he could, but he just drew the line in certain places, you know? Well, one more example, which I, for some reason I incorporated in the PowerPoint, but I forgot to mention, uh, in, you know, uh, in case you know anybody, you know, wink, wink, who, um, who eats fish and meat together, right? So the, um, the Shulchan Aruch in your idea, Kufta Zayin Amud Beis says, sorry, Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, sorry. The Gemara says, Hahi Benita, there was a Benita, which is a, Rashi says it's a dog, it's a fish. I think that's actually the name of the fish now. The Itvuha Bahadi Bisra, that was cooked with meat. Asra, uh, Asra Rava Miparzikia Lemechle Bakutra. So uh, this Rava Miparzikia, that's his name, uh, prohibited it to be eaten uh, um, uh, with, uh, with Kutach. So in other words, this fish with meat that was cooked together, then Rava said it's Asur. And then uh, Rav Ashi Amar Afil B'milcha, Nami Asura, uh, uh, even if it's salted, um, then it's Asur, Mishum Dekasha Larecha Uladavar Acher. It's bad for your breath and it's bad for something else. And Rashi has something else, it's Saras. And the Shulchan Aruch codifies it. Uh, a person needs to be careful to not eat fish, meat and fish together because it will give you saras problems. And the Ramah says, you also shouldn't uh, cook them together because of the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the vapor, the odor. Uh, but if you cook it together, it's not usher. And the Ramah does not bring it down, right? So again, this is presumably another thing where dietarily, you know, they thought that this was going to give you saras, but now we know that fish and meat together doesn't give you saras. And that's why people who don't eat fish and meat together uh, don't, uh, don't do that. Now, one more layer, which is there are people who attach Kabbalistic reasons to these things, and they will hold this based on their Kabbalistic reasons, even if the danger is not there. For example, my Makronim, you know, washing your hands after a meal before you bench was done for Sakana, which was done, you know, because there was this Melach Sodom, Sodom salt, which uh, was a hazard to get into your eyes. Uh, and there are post who hold that since uh, there's no Sodom salt anymore, then we don't do it anymore. Then there are Kabbalists that hold that there's a Kabbalistic reason for it, you know, and that's why they keep on doing it. Um, yeah, uh, Alex? I was always under the impression you uh, don't mix meat with, because of a Sakana reason where when you're eating meat, you're not careful. So you might accidentally like eat the fish and then swallow a bone or something. You know, I've heard that also, but I've not seen that brought down in the post game. And I haven't looked ex exhaustively, but you know, you just saw the Shogun Rock says it's because of Saras, you know? So, uh, yeah. Um, also, that would, the issue that you're mentioning, you know, would seemingly be a problem with, with fish in general, you know, not just with feed, fish and meat. Yeah. Okay, that's all I got for this topic. I, uh, I know there's a different kind of fear than we usually do on Fridays, but hopefully it's, uh, it, it was interesting and enlightening, even though it wasn't as participatory. Um, so... As for your own personal practice, ask your POSIC. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, I guess uh, next week we should be on uh, Lee Netter. Okay. Have a good, uh, good Shabbos. Thank you. Have Bye. A good Thank you.